With Magnavox and Atari pioneering a market for video games, public disinterest, a demand for innovation, and success achieved by both companies would usher in a second generation of gaming consoles. Atari would strike first and will be known as one of the most notorious consoles in gaming history. In 1973, Atari had acquired an engineering think tank named Cyan Engineering and tasked them to research the route for potential next-gen video game systems. One prototype, known as Stella, would eventually become the Atari 2600. And in September of 1977, the 2600 hit North American shelves. The system was vastly superior to any Pong console. It was capable of producing graphics and producing sound, as well as a wide array of colors. Right from the start, the 2600 drew back the interest of the gaming public. The Atari 2600 was head and shoulders above anything else that was commercially available. However, Magnavox would not be left in the dark for long. Similar to Atari, Magnavox, now a subsidiary of Philips, was working on a next-gen follow-up to their successful Odyssey. Their concept came to fruition in July of 1978 when the Odyssey 2 hit store shelves. Being on par with the Atari 2600 initially, the Odyssey 2 was met with a warm reception. Use of cartridges meant that developmental potential for both systems was limitless. The Odyssey 2's hardware was similar to the 2600, with one twist. The Odyssey 2 had a full soft touch alphanumeric keyboard, which could be used for educational games, selecting options, and even programming, a feature that was put to use by the Odyssey cartridge computer intro which literally taught basic computer programming. The two companies stood relatively close, with Atari slightly ahead leading into 1980. However, it was soon realized that the 2600 produced better ports of arcade games than its rival, and in January of 1980, the arcade smash hit Space Invaders made its way onto the Atari 2600. The system took off, leaving the Odyssey 2 in the dust behind it. Atari was proven to be top dog of the second generation battlefield, but soon, a new contender would arise to challenge Atari's dominance. Children's toy and board game company Mattel had been monitoring the popularity of video games with a watchful eye. In 1978, Mattel assigned their electronics division with the task of producing a competitor for the next-gen game consoles already in the market, and in 1980, the Mattel and television became commercially available. Being graphically on par with Atari, Mattel voiced this through numerous marketing comparisons. With Magnavox's Odyssey 2 struggling to keep up with Atari, Mattel used all their resources they've obtained through years of being a children's company to immediately become Atari's biggest competitor. The Intellivision could not only produce better sound quality than its competitors, but it was also the most innovative with a voice producing add-on and even an attempt at an early online network. The Mattel and television was easily the most advanced gaming console of the second generation, and Atari was beginning to lose their dominant grip on the gaming industry. For a while, Mattel and Atari made it appear as though the gaming industry was here to stay. However, a series of bad decisions and an uncontrollable market led to the most disastrous event in video game history. During this time period, Atari did not credit their developers, nor did it pay them royalties. A group of frustrated Atari developers left the company and went on to form Activision, and began developing games for the 2600. Outraged by this, Atari took Activision to court, and lost. This court case would make third-party development legal, and would open up the floodgates for all kinds of companies who had no business in the video game industry developing poor quality games for the 2600 and competitors. Consumers began to feel betrayed by the lack of quality control from their console of choice. The final nail in the coffin would come from Atari rushing to produce highly anticipated games at extremely poor quality, most notably E.T. for the 2600, 
is dubbed by most the game responsible for the breaking point by letting down optimistically waiting consumers. The gaming community was outraged and spoke with their wallets. By 1983, the industry revenues had dropped 97%, causing a majority of smaller developers to go bankrupt in what is now known as the North American video game crash. In the blink of an eye, the gaming industry died. Lack of quality and companies caring more about profit margins led to catastrophe for the entire industry. But how would the industry recover, you ask? Join me next time when I talk about the chosen one that would introduce a new golden standard for all of gaming. Till next time, this is Ness, signing out.